Welcome, everyone. I'm so glad you could join us tonight. Um, this is Jean Wilson. I'm um, a member of the Redbud Board of Directors and also um, co-chair of the plant sale. And I'm very happy to be able to introduce the program, tell a little bit about Rogue Redbud and introduce our speakers tonight. Um, Redbud was founding, founded more than 30 years ago to serve Nevada and Placer counties. It's one of 36 chapters of the California Native Plant Society. Um, our mission is to explore and share the amazing diversity of our local native plants and plant communities and um, to advocate to protect and preserve our rich botanical heritage and to increase awareness of the importance of using native plants in landscaping among other things. We do this by sponsoring events such as tonight's program on creating bird-friendly landscapes. We propagate dozens of native plant species at our recently created uh, propagation center and nursery. Our twice a year native plant sales, such as our online sale coming up on October 1st, offer a wide variety of native plants for every garden. We also lead field trips and offer workshops on, such as ethnobotany, how to grow uh, certain kinds of plants, and um, and other topics. Um, our conservation advocacy committee provides science-based public comment on a wide variety of envi environmental review documents and topics. Our chapter has researched and published two uh, beautifully illustrated guides to wild the wildflowers, trees and shrubs of Nevada and Placer counties, which together uh, describe over 750 of our local species. We couldn't do this without all, all of our wonderful volunteers and whatever your interests and talents, we would love to have you join us. If you are interested in finding out more about volunteer opportunities, please email nativeplanthelp at gmail.com and I'll put that in the chat in a few minutes. I am pleased to introduce tonight's program, Creating Bird-Friendly Gardens. This presentation, created by Nancy and Ames Gilbert, includes stunning photos of birds in their native native plant habitats. It provides essential information on how to create bird attracting gardens and landscapes and features a number of native plants that benefit birds and other wildlife. Topics include essentials for creating good bird habitats such as water, shelter, cover, uh, food, um, perches and nesting resources, um, the benefits and drawbacks of feeding wild birds, how to um, provide um, nesting opportunities and birdhouse ba basics, um, how to include water features, and learning your garden site through observation research. One important point is why incorporating at least 70% native plants in your garden is essential for birds. And um, Nancy will tell you more about that. Uh, Nancy has an MS degree in science education from the University of Iowa and has worked as a naturalist, environmental educator, and classroom teacher, landscape designer, and consultant, and landscape architect and project manager for the US Air Force. She and her husband own and ran a California native bulb nursery, the Far West uh, Bulb Farm, for 25 years. She served as the Redbud Chapter Education Chair, Horticulture Chair, and now is active in the Nursery Steering, steering Committee. She is also a committee member for our plant sales. Um, Nancy, I mentioned those two books before. Nancy was a member of the Red Board Editorial Review Committee that produced those books. Um, and some of her favorite pastimes are gardening, bird watching, photographing wildlife, and native flora interactions. So, without more, we'll begin our pro program. Thank you, Nancy. I'm just getting my screen set up so it works for me. Hold on a minute here. Okay. Yes, hello everyone. I'm um, glad to see we have quite a few people here. Um, I just wanted to say this is an, an in-depth um, presentation. So if it, if it goes a little beyond your tolerance level, it's, uh, you can um, always leave the meeting. I uh, wanted to get in depth because I think there's a lot of basic information out there, but not specific information for our area. Um, 
All the photographs you'll see are either mine or Ames's, plus some uh, digital paintings he's done. And then I give credit to any graphics that um, are not um, ours. So a lot of people might wonder, well, why garden for birds? Uh, there's a lot of really good reasons. Uh, some of them are listed here. Uh, one reason I really like, uh, other than the fact that I really help bird populations, which are in decline all over the world, to um, find habitat here in our area, is that I can see the birds and learn more about birds on my own property. And I can photograph birds. I don't have to drive anywhere. They're in my backyard which means I have a reduced carbon footprint. Um, there's a lot of ways you can create bird habitat, even if you have a small parcel in town. Many people buy homes that are almost all lawn with a few poodle plants at the front door. Well, you can um, convert some of your lawn uh, into a, a pollinator habitat bird garden. Um, you can, um, as you see, um, we really need people to do that because what's happening is habitats are being fragmented all over the world by development. We need to bring birds into town, into our rural areas and the interface, not just for their benefit, but for ours as well. They help control insects and other garden pests. Um, they disperse seeds and berries. They pollinate many plants. They distribute nu nutrients when they defecate and they provide in turn food for a variety of other animals. Um, this lower photo <clears throat> is a picture of our orchard and you can see here what we've done is rather than having non-native ground covers in our orchard, we've created a wildlife habitat garden within the orchard and a hedgerow of native plants which increases our pollination, reduces our pests, and also is, is, I think, really beautiful. Um, other reasons for gardening is, as you can see in the photo above, if you have children or grandchildren, it gives you a very easy way to have your family involved in nature appreciation and bird appreciation. And as we can see in the lower photo, this is a typical subdivision here in Grass Valley. Uh, 2.1 million acres a year are converted to residential loose use and basically that that's lost habitat. So if 80% of our wildlife habitat is privately owned, we can make a big difference by what we do with our landscapes and our properties. And that's a really strong point I wanna make if you're feeling a little overwhelmed by things, this is something we can really do to make a positive influence. I like birds too, because to me, they bring my garden alive, uh, as do other wildlife. Um, it's not just eye candy. I learn about the birds this way, their feeding habits, flight displays. I learn about their mating and nesting and fledgling behaviors. Um, also, if you listen, you will learn about your whole habitat because birds are sentinels. Uh, robins in particular will get alarm calls and you will suddenly be aware, oh, there's a predator in my neighborhood. I need to look. And I recommend these two books here to help make you more aware in your own property of how to really see and become more aware of birds. And also, I really like um, the California Wildlife Habitat Garden book by Nancy Bauer. It's really helpful for people that don't have a design background. And Bringing Nature Home by Douglas Tallamy is his first book where he really shows us why we need to have 70% native plants in our landscapes if we want to see birds and help birds. I'll talk more about that later. Here are some general precautions. If you're going to create a habitat garden, and a bird garden or a pollinator garden, you're going to have to be aware that you're gonna attract other wildlife and some of it may not be as desirable as you wish, such as maybe raccoons and skunks. Uh, we've even had bears and bobcats here, gray foxes, uh, the predatory hawks can come in, which 
some people find disturbing, but is part of nature. Um, and I think it's all part of getting to know your habitat. One important thing to do, and a lot of people don't like this, but if you own a domestic cat, you really need to understand that letting them be outdoors is extremely dangerous for birds. You can see by these statistics that basically one cat can kill 200 birds per year. And that's more than are killed by cars, windows, power lines, all of these things. So if you've got a cat, you need to keep them indoors or build some kind of enclosure for them, or you will be destroying a lot of birds. Some other dangers in our homes for birds that it's very good to be aware of is the amount of bird collisions there are with windows. It's particularly bad in urban areas, skyscrapers, et cetera. But even at our house, where we have put decals and various kinds of screens in front of our windows, sometimes you will have bird strikes during, especially during the migratory season. Both of these birds, um, I'm holding one and here's one on our deck, uh, have died in bird strikes on our windows in spite of our best efforts. But I'm pretty sure our efforts have really reduced bird collisions um, so that's really important to try to take some kind of measures. We'll talk more about that later. Another one many people don't realize is that night lighting is contributing very largely to the demise of migratory birds. They mostly migrate at night. They're coming and navigating by stars and magnetic signals. If the cities are all lit up, birds can get totally confused and draw, just fly in circles and have disorientation and exhaustion. If you have strong uplights in your landscape, such as uh, many people do for effect, that will very seriously affect birds that are migrating. So some of the things you can do are listed here. Um, turn off your interior and exterior lighting later in the evening until early morning. Uh, I give a website there where you can go and actually see when birds are migrating in your area, it's very, very helpful for when to be more cautious. And shut off bright lights, up lights in your landscape areas. And then you can orient your lights like this so they all shine downwards and use warm light instead of bright white light. And you can also install motion sensors on your light. So these are important things you can do in your garden to really make it safer for birds. So these are the basic things that almost all life needs to live. Um, uh, there's a few unique things birds need and we'll be discussing those. This photo is a very nice garden in Grass Valley. It's a all nat pretty much native garden with a lot of artistic um, ceramics and bird baths in it. And I think many people just don't realize how beautiful a habitat garden can be, particularly if you have a sense of uh, design and artistry. So there are different ways birds can obtain food. One, of course, is our bird feeders, but the primary way is through nature's bird food, which is mostly through insects and plants and the food they offer. The plants offer, as we know, berries, fruits, nuts, seeds, even sap, and flowers rich in nectar and pollen for birds such as hummingbirds. So if you deadhead all your plants immediately and don't let any seed or fruit form, you're really cutting back on your habitat value and your ecosystem value. So I advise people to, to head out, to hold back on that as long as possible. This is a bush tit eating coffee berries, which is one of our excellent bird plants. A rufous hummingbird at our what used to be called Sauchneri is now Epilobium, California fuchsia, and a red elderberry. These are all excellent bird plants. What you want to have birds in your garden at, you wanna provide food year round. So you try to select species that provide value in all four seasons. So flowers, nuts, berries, sap, etc. You choose your, your species based on that such as service berries, which are ripe later in the year, 
Many of our native bulbs are in spring and early summer, as you can see here, the hummingbird feeding at the Humboldt lily. This is uh, Idamea, which is a native bulb native to the coast, which does quite well here. It's called firecracker flower, and you certainly see why. Very attractive to hummingbirds. Uh, I incorporate a few non-natives in our garden that flower very late. That's, that's kind of a good niche for them because a lot of our natives are done. The important thing is to make sure you have at least 70% natives, and we'll discuss why later. The other really important thing is to strive for a pesticide-free garden. Uh, more and more scientific studies are showing how devastating pesticides are for birds. They kill insects that they require to live. They also build up in birds' bodies and negatively affect their health and reproduction. Neonicotinoids are a good example. They affect the neurological functioning of birds. So try to go natural and only use in the the natural safe products only when you really, really need to. Usually if you have a good bird population, they're gonna, as you can see, eat a lot of these insects that you might consider a pest. As far as bird feeders go, it really does allow you to see a lot more birds up close. It's a lot of fun. Uh, feeders are often ornamental. Uh, it allows birds to get food when they really need it, such as, and you can see here during a snowstorm or when they're feeding their youngsters. But there are caveats to that. Use a few pictures I've taken at our place and at other people's places of just how close birds can get to where you live. Here's a deck that's basically one big bird feeding station, and it's really quite fun to sit on her deck and observe all these birds coming in to feed. But here's some of the drawbacks. You have to keep them clean and maintain them and use fresh seed, or you can actually kill birds by spreading diseases. So you must avoid food contamination. And if you have your feeders up during the breeding season, then you need to continue feeding because they've established territories and they're depending on you. You can attract um, the bird feeders themselves and you need to put seed catchers under them or locate them far away from your house or you may end up with all kinds of rodents and unwanted visitors coming into your garden. Um, <clears throat> as you may know, a lot of people were asked to bring their feeders down last winter because of eye, house eye finch disease, which was affecting many species of finches and pine siskins and um, so I only feed myself during really adverse weather. And then by the time, time the gross beaks start arriving, I stop feeding. I want them to be independent, not, not concentrated at my house where predators start uh, skulking in the trees, taking out the birds. So, um, I've already mentioned some of this. Uh, don't stop suddenly. Just let the bird feeder slowly empty naturally. Also, you should locate them so that they don't, the birds don't end up colliding with your windows. That's very important. Some people use this kind of strategy you see below to try to keep birds from flying into their windows. You can put window screens up you can put twirlers in front of your window, parachute cord, all, there's a lot of information on this, which we'll discuss in more detail. Probably the second most important thing for birds and probably equally important for all living things is water. And personally, if as long as you have time to keep your water features clean, I think this is one of the most rewarding ways to attract birds into the garden because it has so many other benefits you do have to keep it very clean, but it beautifies your garden. Birds absolutely need water, not just for drinking, but they have to bathe to maintain their feathers. And basically, even if you don't have a bird bath, just having a, a few misters out in your landscape can, can attract small birds, which don't usually use bird baths, but prefer to fly through the mist and get in the wet leaves. 
This is a big pond at a friend's house with shallow areas. Most of us don't have that kind of, or wouldn't probably develop that. This is also a member's garden where he has a little waterfall, but he's built in very shallow areas like this. And while I was visiting, the juncos were taking baths in the shallows. So it it's beautiful. The sound is beautiful. And it also provides all this uh, habitat for the birds. So it's a very uh, efficient and lovely way to attract birds and support them. Here's some examples of some of the guests you might get besides birds at your bird bath. Some not as welcome as others, but actually I've enjoyed watching all of these. Uh, this is a California sister butterfly that comes to our bird path to drink. You'll see foxes, squirrels, and with our game camera, we've caught raccoons, bears, and others. So bird bath basics. A lot of bird baths sold out there actually aren't that great. Uh, they are either too deep or they're made of rough concrete, which is really hard to clean when algae starts to grow and they crack when it freezes. So I like smooth ceramic or some kind of really tough plastic or natural stone, as you see below. Also, many commercial bird baths are just too deep. Most birds don't want to go into water that's more than about two inches deep and small birds, a half an inch is all about it. So sloping, gently sloping sides are really good. And you can add some gravel at the bottom for better footing. Uh, I've also discovered that um, shady location is much better for the birds and for you because in the sun, the water really heats up and you get a lot more algae. So you can locate them at ground level, uh, two or three feet above ground. They sell bird baths that can actually attach to the railing of your deck. All of them will work. So some of the things you want to do, these were taken, uh, these pictures at my sister's house who has a, a bird feeding station and bird bath areas. Um, and so it's quite fun to visit and watch her birds. You want it fairly open directly around it so the birds can see a predator if it's coming in, such as a Cooper's hawk. So a little bit of ways, you want some cover that they can flee to. So some nice native evergreen shrubs where they can take cover is very important. And it's very nice to locate them so you have a good view because that's part of the joy of having them. And remember to change them frequently and sanitize them. Uh, I use a little bleach now and then. And then it's quite nice if you can add a dripper or a mister to your bird feature because this, just the sound of the water attracts birds. And they, as you can see here, the, the goldfinches basically line up on this bamboo spout to drink the drips that come off. They really like that. Here's just some photos so you can see how what a great variety of birds a bird bath will attract. Sometimes birds you don't see very often because they're up in the canopy. There's grosbeaks, jays, chickadees, hermit thrushes, turkeys, bluebirds, band-tailed pigeons, which pretty much empty your bird bath when they're done, uh, thrushes and finches, towhees, on the right, a nuthatch. Acorn woodpeckers, robins. These are the lovely little yellow rump warblers and beautiful western tanager, which you rarely see, but if you have water, they will come down to drink. And this is kind of fun. This is where we have some sprinklers. The little birds like the bush tits and the wrens all come in when we're overhead watering with a fine mist because they like to take a bath in the mist and fly through it, as do the hummingbirds. Also, some of the rare and shire birds you'll be able to see. Townsend's warblers, Nashville warblers, tanagers, Wilson's warbler, morning doves. Um, it's just really a great way to see what birds are actually in your area. The other thing birds really need is some kind of shelter and protective color cover. In winter, particularly if we get snow, which we've been getting, these dense evergreen shrubs really provide birds 
with a place to get out of the snow and get a little sun and escape. And of course, many birds like quail just and towhees, they really require protective cover. You won't have them in your garden unless you have some shrubs and grasses and places for them. So these are some of the birds that really enjoy having fairly dense vegetation. So I know we all are trying to balance between being fire safe and habitat. So um, I try to create closer to my home, native plants, plant native plants that can take some occasional water, can be pruned back or naturally grow lower. Even the lower growing plants like this emerald carpet manzanita, both here and here, will attract. Oh, what is that doing? Will attract birds. Uh, the kinglet, which is here, really likes dense foliage. So if you have such a clean landscape, you've cleared out every manzanita, every shrub, the birds like this simply will not occur. Shane, do you know how to get rid of this squiggle I got in here? <laughs> or we'll just have to live with it. I have yeah, no Yeah, I'm afraid I, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea what's going on. Um, um, let me get rid of the arrow. I don't know. Anyway, I'm sorry. It just appeared when I moved my uh, pointer. The um, other thing you can do uh, to provide habitat is you can create these uh, brush piles, small ones, and away from your house and not under trees. And this provides great cover for birds like towhees and juncos. Uh, rock outcrops uh, provide great habitat, particularly for, in this case, a burrowing owl. And you can also install roosting bird houses, which provide winter homes and shelter for birds like chickadees and titmice, which often nest colonial when it's cold to stay warm. Oh, that squiggle is so annoying. Um, so birds need perches. So if you prune every dead branch and every snag for fire, that's going too far because birds need perches for a whole lot of reasons. They need them to survey their territory, to look for predators, to locate food, to defend their territories, to escape predators. And so I try to prune my shrubs, but leave some bare branches for them. Uh, this is a pygmy owl, which was using a, a branch on an oak to drop down and catch grasshoppers. Uh, the fly catchers really, really need perches because they hunt by hawking, which is flying out from an open perch and collecting an insect in midair. And of course, our, our raptors all need perches for hunting. Here's some more pictures of birds that are basically using branches, fairly bare branches, in this case, to defend territory, to find prey, to find prey, a flycatcher, Pacific Coast flycatcher, which is watching for an insect flying by. More birds using perches that tend to hunt from their perches kingbirds, chats, sparrows, and meadowlark. The other reason to have some pruning perches is so birds can preen in the sunshine. They, after they take a bath in your bird bath, they're going to want to preen their feathers. Birds must groom their feathers, and they spend a lot of time doing this because their life depends on it. They have an oil gland located here. They use that with their beak to lubricate and oil all their feathers. They fluff up like this little hummingbird to dry their feathers. Here are many birds using various sunny perches for preening. It's actually quite fun to watch. They do some pretty good acrobatics and they seem to really enjoy it. 
also, as we clear our woodlands for fire, if you can leave some snags, it's really important for birds and other wildlife. This is a vulture nest and a completely hollowed out oak. Vultures only lay at most two eggs a year. They absolutely uh, are dependent on these kind of cavities to survive, as are pileated woodpeckers, tree swallows, Acorn woodpeckers use old oaks for granaries, as you can see here. They've pecked holes and they're storing all these acorns. They're colonial, they store hundreds of acorns for the winter. So you need to leave some snags where they're not a hazard to your home or a fire hazard. So we'll talk a little bit about the other important thing is everything has to have a place and the resources to rear your young. And birds have an amazingly wide diversity of places they nest. The killdeer in the upper left builds its nest on bare rock. The meadowlark uses grass as does the junco. Uh, they, these birds actually will hide their nests under logs, bunches of grass, even a, an old, if you just leave an old toad out, they might build their nest underneath it. So again, some more varieties. This is a turkey nest down on the ground. It's amazing, but they hide them very well. And the female lays extremely low and doesn't even move for hours on end. The robin up in a tree high up in the canopy of the oak. And our bush tits make the most amazing nests. They weave together lichens and mosses and spider webs and make this long sock. And they often work on it as a group and raise their young that way. Some more nests. Um, many birds you'll see gathering grasses. Um, the robin uses grasses and mud. She's tamping the mud down in the bottom right here. And this is a mountain chickadee and just what was left of a lightning strike snag and she had a nest in there. I enjoy these nesting choices. Hummingbirds are very creative. Uh, these are nesting on a, a decorative bell in a carport and this hummingbird built her nest on top of our electric outlet for our Christmas tree lights, which being fairly lazy we didn't take down so for her it was habitat and of course the bank swallows and other some other swallows build nud mud nests they're gathering mud here up under bridges on cliffs etc so for some birds being able to find a source of water and dirt for mud is very important as you can see this robin it is rather annoying. They get a whole beak full of mud and then they use your bird bath. They get the dirt and they use their bird bath to make it nice and gooey and fly off to their nest to construct it. And then you have to clean your bird bath out. Uh, they also really like some birds to build their nest in very dense vines, such as uh, this Dutchman's pipe or in California grape. And this is what I get. I clean out my birdhouses every year and it allows me to see and try to decide who used this nest. Um, this was a bluebird house but it looks to me like a Buick's wren used this house. These are just some pictures of birdhouses we put up on our property and this is one that a friend puts up for barn owls. Um, it's important if you put up birdhouses to realize that other animals are well aware of what they are. Ravens will steal the, the fledglings and the eggs, squirrels, snakes. So I advise you to mount them either on a very smooth steel pipe, or in our case, we use PVC pipe and put it on top of a T-post. You know, or you can buy special predator guards here. I also use these kind of predator guards and we put the metal uh, protectors on because unfortunately woodpeckers will often decide to enlarge the hole which really is very destructive to your birdhouse. These are just a few more pictures of interesting nests 
Uh, this hummingbird, uh, I only knew this nest was here because I saw her fly into it. It is so beautifully camouflaged up in a live oak. Uh, this was at Gray Lodge in the middle of the winter. We found these owl nests up in the cottonwoods. Also at Gray Lodge, oriole nest up in the mistletoe. Chickadees will nest in houses and also they will use hollows in snags. So if you start, most people wanna just jump right in and buy their plants and start. But I advise people to go start slower and be sure and do some observation and research of your property first if you're not really familiar with it. Get to know what's in your landscaping already, what kind of birds and plants and other wildlife, what kind of soil you have, what kind of communities. Observe all of that very carefully. And then you can visit parks, gardens, nature centers, such as the Placer Nature Center here or the Davis Arboretum to get a picture of some of the ways you can create habitat in your garden. Also, we have local resources. We have our Nevada uh, uh, County Natural Resources Conservation District Office, which has great information on habitat gardening and wildlife. You can buy some binoculars, get your camera out, and really get to know which species of birds are on your property, what time of year, and what your seasonal migrants. We've used camera traps on our property. It's a lot of fun if you want to find out more, because a lot of the times we don't see who's really on our property, particularly at night. And a camera trap can really be eye-opening. So these are some of the pictures of we found using camera traps and various other phot photography, uh, what's on our property. So you, I have dozens and dozens of these, but uh, here's a great horned owl coming to a bird bath, a bobcat. Look at all these deer, coyotes, foxes, possums, lots of possums and raccoons. So what we try to do when we're designing and laying out our bird gardens to attract a lot of birds is to mimic nature. So where the most biodiversity is in nature is at what are called edges. This is where two or more habitats converge and meet. So you get very different types of vegetation meeting up. This is a lovely meadow at a CNPS member's home right up against wood, open oak woodland, a very fast transition. And right in this transition zone are a lot of birds because the turkeys and many other species are moving between these habitats. And you get these different layers and types of vegetation. Another really rich zone are riparian corridors through creeks, rivers, places like that where you have a definite habitat here and then uphill from it, a very different habitat. So you can create this, this similar kind of situation in your garden by mimicking these edges. Here's some examples of how you can create edge in your garden. You do it with structural changes and vertical horizontal layering and diversity. If you have, for instance, a yard that's really flat, I suggest you do some grading work and create some high spots and low spots and put in some rock outcrops and berms. So you have moisture areas, drier areas, and lots of different opportunities. Um, shrub beds are most attractive to birds if they're in large drifts, meandering and under undulating like this along a nice path. It gives kind of a mosaic effect. Uh, you can take your manicured lawn area and reduce it in size, make it an irregular shape and border it with many different tiers of shrubs and perennials. And you can create also, if you've got trees, shun sunnier and shadier gardens. And if you want, if you have downspouts, you can create a rain garden such as this, where you can have wetland plants and attract and have plants that attract some very interesting wildlife. 
Here's some more examples of layering and vertical diversity. Usually what you'd want to do as in uh, Chrissy's garden here is she had, this was all Bermuda grass. So she spent two years just getting control of that before she did anything. And if you want to know how she did it, I think she has information on our website. You want your larger canopy trees and such here, and then you have your taller shrubs and you come down into lower shrubs, eventually into kind of a meadow atmosphere with wildflowers and flowering perennials. This allows you to see into your garden and see who's using it. It also gives birds a lot of visibility, but also shelter. And it allows many different species of birds to use your garden to, to feed, nest, and shelter at the same time. Gives you a, a great view. Plus, it's really beautiful. Um, this is the hedgerow we've created along the fence line in our orchard with all natives. These are some photos to give you some ideas of what you could do in a more town setting. I would strongly encourage people to uh, attend the uh, Sacramento Valley Spring Garden Tours. They're really instructive and they visit some wonderful homes and they have them in all different parts of Sacramento, depending on what area is closest to you. This, this house was in the same neighborhood as these houses. These homes are a typical suburban American home with a big amount of green lawn, which is heavily irrigated, maybe one shade tree, which is often a species that's in decline, like a Modesto ash, and then heavily pruned foundation planting. Okay, this garden is not particularly inhabitable by wildlife and really not that inviting for people, unless maybe you want to play croquet. Um, However, gardens, I think, should be for people and wildlife to share and enjoy. And this patio to me is like my ideal of what, how to combine <laughs> a garden for people and wildlife. Um, they used mostly natives in their backyard. Uh, it was extremely inviting to me personally, and they had all kinds of birds and wildlife in their garden. These homes also, they just basically tore out all their front lawn, made a very nice entry and landscaped the whole thing with natives as did this home. Um, I think it's a great tour and you can get great ideas. You can talk to the owners and find out what all the plants are. So it's really instructive. One thing that kind of bothers people is that habitat gardens and bird gardens and pollinator gardens look a little unruly and untidy. And in some housing, big housing developments, such as is going on in Roseville, everybody wants their yard to be eye candy, but they have not figured out yet that gardens can also be home to wildlife. So you're going to maybe have to educate your neighbors as you move along and Try to make your garden both beautiful and wildlife friendly and people friendly. These are some examples of people of habitat gardens. They look quite natural, but and they are, but they're all man-made and quite, I think, beautiful. This house was built in a big meadow, so they just capitalized on that. Mo parts of it have lots of wildflowers and native plants on the edge. This is a garden at our house, which doesn't really look like a garden, except there's a pot here. I've got all kinds of native shrubs I've planted and it's partially irrigated, so it's fire safe. And these, this could just as easily be a picture I took in the Sierra Nevadas, but it's not. It's a photo I took right here in my own garden. And as you can see, there's a carpenter bee here and it attracts all kinds of hummingbirds and wildlife. And I personally think it's beautiful and really enjoy it. So if you're going to design your own garden, which a lot of people are do-it-yourselfers, there's some things you should learn about the landscape design process. Um, most people just jump in and buy their plants first, but ideally you wouldn't do that. You would first educate yourself. Uh, you could take courses or workshops. You can study books, websites, a CNPS State and local website chapters have lots of interesting and helpful information, not just on plants, but designing your garden. 
habitat gardening. There's YouTube videos. You can visit gardens and see how they've done it. Um, so during those hot summer months when you really shouldn't be planting much, you can educate yourself. Um, you can hire a professional if you wish, and that's a very good way to go, but it also is not affordable by some people. Uh, my husband's very good in Adobe Acrobat, so he did this site plan first of our house. So we actually knew what was here and what was where and where the water flowed, what the topography is. But you could just do this with a sketch. Here's an example. We taught a class called Sierra Smart Gardening for our chapter many years ago and helped people learn how to do this. Underneath is your basic site plan, which you may have gotten through the county maps. You may have measured your own yard and created it. And then you use layers of trace paper to start the design process. So it's a little bit like having AutoCAD, only it's a paper process. You have layers. First, you lay out your paths your walkways, if you want a pond, where your downspouts are, where your parking is. And then you later come in and put in where your plantings are. And you might end up, it may not be quite this beautiful, but you could end up with something sort of like this. This is called a concept plan. It doesn't name every single type of plant, but it shows you and keeps you on track for your general wishes for your property, what you're trying to accomplish, because form follows function, not the other way around. Uh, this is just a picture of me putting in a pond at our house many years ago. And we're do-it-yourselfers, and it's a lot of fun, but it's hard work. So here we go with the 70% native plants. Why do you want 70% native California trees, shrubs, and perennials in your garden? Why do you not want to just have the typical Home Depot exotic plants? There's a really good reason for that. Doug Tallamy, who's an entomologist, has done a lot of research. And he and his students have discovered that basically almost all of the birds we are familiar with feed their young almost exclusively insects. And caterpillars are their favorite food because they're soft and juicy. So if you do not provide the caterpillars they need to feed their young, chickadees being a good example, they simply won't nest and won't be on your property. So basically, native plants are what our insects have evolved with. So that all the insects feed on our native plants far more than they do on exotic plants. And some species in particular, which we'll talk about later, later, provide a huge amount of insect life. So if you want birds to nest and flourish on your property, you need to have native plants for the songbirds. The other advantage is native plants are basically drought tolerant, heat tolerant. They live here. They don't need fertilizer. And you can, you can even mix them in in your orchards, your gardens. Like this is a beautiful garden. The native, they kept their native, some of their native uh, uh, manzanitas, pruned them up so they were fire safe, planted wildflowers and created this beautiful uh, native garden, which also was full of bees, butterflies and birds. The important thing is with going natives is you avoid introducing really horrible invasive exotics into your landscape. Uh, we have 6,500 native species, and the numbers are growing. We are a biodiversity hotspot. There are native plants for every garden and every type of ecosystem and land. So you really have a huge, amazing choice of plants. And yet we already have over 1,800 non-native plants in the wild, and 200 are invasive and quite a few have naturalized. I'm sure we're all familiar with the horrible Scotch, French, and Spanish broom, English ivy, vinca. Those were all introduced by the nursery trade. So at least if you go native, you're not going to be creating a little shop of horrors in your garden. So I'm going to just quickly go through now some of, there's so many native plants that are useful for bird gardens. I can't possibly go through them all, but we'll cover some of the really what I call all-stars. They are multitaskers. They offer multiple benefits to birds, insects, 
and wildlife. And on top of that, they're very amenable to your landscape. And it will give you a variety of choices with differing sizes, branching structures, foliage, and densities to use. And most of them are very well adapted here that I'll be showing you. So you will achieve your goal of maximizing the abundance of flowers and seeds and insects and protective cover throughout all four seasons. So you'll be trying to kind of mirror our natural ecosystem, but in a more controlled way and a safer way <laughs> for your property. <clears throat> I, these are the symbols I use with the slides for plants. They're kind of self-explanatory having to do with the drought tolerance level and water uses of the plant, the amount of sun they like, how cold hardy they are, as you can see here, whether they're really beneficial for insects, particularly bees and pollinating insects, noting neonicotinoid pesticides are killing bees. So if you do shop for plants, I'd say ask the nursery, are your plants neonicotide free or not? We need to encourage our nurseries to carry stock that is not. Because if you buy a plant in a nursery that's supposed to feed pollinators and it has neonics in them, they last up to a year in the plant and will kill the very bees you're trying to attract and feed. This is a plant that attract hummingbirds, birds, butterflies, and moths. A plants that are pretty deer resistant. It's really not possible to have most plants. There's a few that are 100%. And then the flammability thing is still a work in progress. I put it in there for plants that are have a lot of resins in them that can be flashy, but a lot of plants have a bad reputation and they're actually not that bad in your fire landscape if they're located 30 feet from your house and kept pruned. Um, some people just go crazy. They bring in a masticator and just decimate the landscape. That is not wildlife friendly. <laughs> so probably the most, I would call it a keystone species. Keystone's like a keystone in, in building a gate or wall. That stone holds it all together. Keystone species, whether they're plants or animals, are so important to the ecosystem that if you remove them, it's going to change the entire ecosystem and effect and cascade throughout. Uh, in our area, uh, oaks are probably the keystone species for birds and other wildlife. As you can see, you have many choices and most of us have oaks on our property already, or if you don't, you can buy them and plant them. They are a huge source of food they're a huge source of shelter, and they're very attractive to moths and butterflies who lay their eggs on them, and those caterpillars provide that necessary food for nestlings. They also, as you can see this little bush tit turning leaves over with his foot looking for very small insects, and of course the acorns feed a huge number of wildlife species. And there's an oak for almost every habitat and soil type. Here's just some photos to give you an idea of just pictures I've taken. And one a friend of mine took of a bear trying to harvest acorns on a, literally out on a limb, risking life and limb to get acorns. Um, the California sister, this is the larval host plant for it. So it lays its eggs on the oak trees. Many moth species lay their eggs on oaks and the caterpillars feed the birds. Sap suckers are fond of young oaks. They get their sap there. And of course, squirrels are master harvesters of acorns. And many, many bird species use oaks for multiple purposes. So treasure your oak trees. So the entire aster family, I couldn't list them all, it would just be far too many, are useful not just to birds, but look at all the other uses they have. Uh, the aster family is extremely important to pollinators, but in addition, many birds utilize the seeds. As you can see, this goldfinch eating the seeds of woolly sunflower. They will also eat the seeds of things like goldenrod, which are very nice because they bloom late in the year. 
Um, they're the host plant to many caterpillars, which the birds like. So I really encourage people to use native um, aster family, uh, sunflowers, daisies, mule ears, balsam roots, yarrows, madias, uh, gumweed. They're all extremely useful in the landscape. Uh, for moisture areas, I really, really like columbines because first of all, they're extremely beautiful. Uh, they're very frost hardy. They're very easy to grow. They will seed around and expand themselves and you attract uh, bumblebees, native bees, and as you can see, hummingbirds. Uh, they do need some water, but they're tap rooted so they can become somewhat drought tolerant and they'll just go dormant if it's too hot or too dry. And then in the final analysis, the seeds, they make a lot of seeds are relished by the birds. Now this is one I had never had before, but they showed up and I've spread the seed and it's a biennial, which means it only lives two years. But if you're into hummingbirds, I really recommend it. It's our native cobwebby thistle. And it's not, not nearly as weedy and doesn't spread everywhere like the invasive non-native thistles. And when it's in bloom, it's quite beautiful. And then it, it dies back, but it has set seed and we'll start new plants for the following year. And as you can see, this is probably the favorite plant of the hummingbirds this year on my property. Then later, the goldfinches and other birds would collect the fluff from the seeds for their nests. Um, so I've, I consider it a really, I, I don't know that you would want to plant it in Sun City. The neighbors might think it's too weedy, but certainly for those of us that live on bigger properties, it's a wonderful addition to the bird garden. Of course, our California fuchsias, uh, epilobium, there are many cultivars and forms of this, and we'll have a lot of them at our plant sale. This is probably overall the premier hummingbird plant that we can put in our gardens. And it's so beautiful. Most people, when they see it in a garden, want to know what it is right away. And there's so many different cultivars. Some are quite flat. Some are quite tall. Some are more drought tolerant than others. They do best with a little bit of water. So it's very good in that area close up to your home where you're doing some watering and allows you to get a really close up view of the hummingbirds. I actually took all these pictures from my dining room window because we have it right outside our window. This is, is one that is really, the hummingbirds love it as do the bees, but it needs quite a lot of water. So if you have a riparian area at your home or you're creating a rain garden or you have a seep or right next to your lawn, this is a good choice for birds because it is just loaded with hummingbirds all summer. And it's, it's designed for hummingbirds. Look at this flower with the long tube. Here's the reproductive part sticking out so that when the hummingbird comes in, it touches the top of their head, deposits pollen on their head, and when they visit the next flower, they pollinate it. So it's, it is a, a designer, hummingbird designer plant. Of, of the bunch grasses, um, I, there are many of them that are quite nice to add to your landscape, but I particularly like deer grass because it's so durable and showy. And it really is a great habitat plant for birds. The juncos love it. They eat the seed, they hide in it, they build their nests under it. And it, I like it too, because it, it just stands out in the landscape as something very unusual and different. I do advise you though, that you do need to cut it back every few years for fire and rejuvenate it. It's nice also because it's a warm season grass, which means it's basically green in the summer and dormant in the winter, which is much better for fire. The, all the sages, the salvias, the native salvias are excellent bird plants. Uh, hummingbird sage, which you see here, is a particularly strong attractant to hummingbirds of all types. And although it's native to the coast, it does quite well here in partial shade with occasional water, and it's a very beautiful plant. It's basically a ground cover with a tall flower stalk, so it will fill in nicely under your shrubs and trees. And where the chaparral shrubby uh, salvias are more like a, a woody shrub, 
they can be pruned back and they are a bit flammable. So I locate these further away from the house and cut them back, but they're very attractive to all the pollinators and the hummingbirds. And then we have our locally native creeping sage, which is very flat and is an excellent ground cover on banks and attracts all kinds of pollinators. And then finches like to come in and eat the seeds. And of course, our manzanitas, many people are destroying all the manzanitas on their property. This is extremely unfortunate because in fact, it's not more flammable than other plants. It's just that if it does catch fire, it burns incredibly hot. So you would not locate it near a house or a carport. But if you trim it up and keep the dead wood out, of all our native plants, it ranks in the top two or three for bird gardens. And there are many, many varieties. This is our local white leaf manzanita, which is an excellent bird plant. They bloom when it's still winter. They'll be blooming in February and March. Here's hummingbirds feeding at it during snow. Um, I've got pictures of bees feeding at them in the snow. So it blooms so early, it's really important food for birds like hummingbirds. And then later on the berries are so important to all of our berry eating birds, uh, robins, bluebirds, hermit thrushes, um, just an incredible variety of birds. I'll be showing you some of those. Um, and then there's some really nice coastal cultivars, which are lower growing and maybe a little more, quote, civilized looking for more urban gardens, which could give you some of the same benefits. They just need a little water, whereas our local natives don't want any summer water. Once they're established, you can actually kill them. Here's a nice, very readily available, low-growing shrub ground cover manzanita called emerald carpet. Um, there are other low-growing manzanitas like this that you can use on your bank. Uh, these are uh, on our bank behind our house. These are Wilson's warblers and bush tits. I overhead water it once a week, and that's when all these birds will come in to take a bath in the leaves, and it's really fun to watch. It's, it's super attractive. It's not very flammable. It's easy to prune back and keep compact. Um, I highly recommend it in mixed borders and on banks draped over rocks and retaining walls for all habitat uh, gardens and bird gardens. Of course, our um, Oregon grapes, the barberries, are excellent for birds for a whole lot of reasons. The flowers attract lots of pollinators and they make these wonderful berries, which birds just love. Of course, they will eat them and spread them around your property uh, when they defecate the seeds and plant them. The leaves are evergreen and very prickly, which makes them an excellent shelter plant for birds to hide in when a predator shows up. They will, you will watch them, they will all run to a patch. I plant these in a large patch, so they have maximum value for. Uh, shelter. And you can rejuvenate them by pruning them all the way back to the ground and they'll shoot up new growth from the ground, which is quite nice for um, trying to control the height and width because they do spread by rhizomes. Of course, Ceanothus, what would California be without our California lilacs? When in flower, they are probably one of the most beautiful plants that we have in our area. These are both photos of a locally native one, which I think is really beautiful. This is lemon ceanothus. But there are many other ceanothus that will work in our area, some from the coast. And they have flower colors to white, lilac, blue, all the way into cobalt blue. Um, the birds are particularly fond of the seeds and they make good nesting sites for to towhees and sparrows. They're very pollinator friendly. And the really great thing about them is Ceanothus fix nitrogen in the soil. So they build up your soils. The deer do browse them. So I suggest planting the ones with small leaves and prickly leaves. The deer are much less, less, less likely to like wipe them out. Plus Ceanothus tend to come back pretty quick if they're browsed, as long as it's not over browsed. I think this may be right, this is right up there with um, manzanitas and that's our coffee berry. And there are quite a few cultivars of this which are different sizes, but I really like our local species. They're, once they're established, you don't need to water them at all. 
they produce a tremendous slowly ripening crop of berries in the fall, which calls in all kinds of birds. They also provide, even though the flowers aren't showy, a great deal of pollen. They are just buzzing with bees in the spring. And they're very easy to grow, fast growing, and you can coppice them and get new growth whenever you like. You can cut the canes to the ground or you can prune them into tree form. Here's some examples of some of the many birds that we've seen here on our property in them. We get tanagers, bluebirds, grosbeaks, warblers, thrushes, towhees. Um, it's a chance to really see a lot of birds if you plant some coffee berries. Another real magnet for uh, fall migrating birds or our local residents is um, our toyon. Heteromeles arbutifolia. It's a wonderful plant. It's a, it's a big plant though, but it makes a wonderful screen or hedge. It's a low flammability, which is a really big plus for people who are trying to want something to screen a view, but they want it to be low flammability. It is in the rose family and so has these beautiful white flowers, which attract lots of pollinators and the berries ripen late in the year, usually from about Christmas on, in fact, are most attractive to birds after we've had some frost. So this is a super adaptable, easy plant. You can have it once established with no water or it will grow faster with occasional water. And here's some pictures of the kind of birds that we see in our neighborhood. Uh, you can see that in a snowstorm, it's an incredibly useful plant for birds such as bluebirds and robins. It's also um, often the cedar waxwings will be in the flocks with the bluebirds. And as you can see here, it's actually just a really, I think, very attractive shrub, especially with the berries. We will be having these at our plant sale for those of you who might be interested. And then the ribes, which are basically the flowering currants and gooseberries. We have our locally native species, uh, the Sierra gooseberry. The gooseberries have thorns, uh, which make them really good shelter for birds, but not real great around the front door. Um, but they are very popular with birds and pollinators, the berries. Um, we have our red coastal Ribes sanguinium, which attracts hummingbirds as well as pollinators. And then they all make these nice blueberries, which usually the robins pick off later in the year. There are many cultivars of this. Um, it's very adaptable. I think they do a lot better with occasional summer water. Uh, if you don't give them summer water, they will survive, but they will drop most of their leaves. And uh, this is a really big shrub, but it's an incredible bird plant. And that is our blue elderberry. It's deciduous and it does need some water, but it is um, offers all of the bird requirements that we're looking for. It's shelter, food, nesting sites, cover, and it also allows you to make elderberry jam and elderberry wine. So if you've got a spot for elderberries, you've got a lot of space and you've got some moist areas or you can irrigate it. It's a wonderful plant to include in all bird gardens. And there are many, many more. Uh, there's just not time to cover them all, but there's a lot of information on Calscape about the kind of pollinators and birds that these plants do a, a support. So with that in mind, I just want to remind people that of our native plant sale, it's coming up real soon this fall. Um, it's an online plant sale again this year. Uh, it starts on October 1st. Um, you can see here that we have a special time from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. for members only. And the members will receive an access code. Then the general public can shop from 1 p.m. to 8 p.m. and they don't need a code. Um, our theme this year is native plants are for the birds, which fits in with the slideshow and all the details about how to do the online shopping, signing up for picking up your plants at the nursery is on our website here. If you go to the website and go to the plant sale page, um, it has been fully documented with how to uh, purchase plants and some sage advice 
if you've got a long, long list of how to get your top priority plants. It also has links to Calscape so you can learn about the plants ahead of time and have your list ready. So that's all from me. Um, I hope that, um, this show helped you get some good ideas and helps you um, plan your garden and helps you feel like you can make a difference by developing a habitat bird garden at your home. So it's time for questions. If anybody has any, I'll turn it over to Shane and I um, will um, turn it over to Jean. Yes, hi. Um, this is Jean again, and we did get some questions during your presentation that I have here, and I'm going to go ahead and read them in order. And the first one was, uh, do you have an opinion on heated bird baths uh, um, in the winter? Yeah, I mean, I think they work fine. I don't have one, so I can't speak from experience. Uh, it's really important for people that are further north, like in zone six. Um, I just go out because I have my bird baths are either plastic, which is pretty easy to deal with, or ceramic, and I can just tap the ice and push it out. Um, but I think, um, particularly on a deck or something where electricity is readily available, it might be a really good idea. Okay, great. Thank you. And then there was a question about butterfly bush. Um, what is your opinion of butterfly bush? I know they are invasive, but my house backs onto an old growth forest. This is in Seattle and birds love to hide in them. Mine are the size of small trees. I'm debating whether to take them out. Um, any thoughts on that? Well, I wouldn't take them out till you know what you wanna replace them with. Um, they are providing some habitat, but they have a very definite downside. Um, they're also not real long lived, but I do have some non native plants here, but they're not invasive. And that's the key. Like I, I find uh, some plants are invasive other places, but not here. You really need to visit our, the invasive plant website and learn what plants are invasive to your area. Personally, I would find an alternative, uh, either pot them up into a larger pot till they're a fairly good size and take them out and replace them with a native plant that fulfills the exact same ecosystem functions. Um, I, I took a look online, thanks Nancy. I took a look online and there are several sites for different areas of the country where they talk about um, alternatives to um, butterfly bush for various areas of the country. So I think you can probably find some options um, that you can look at and so, yeah, I mean, there's even there's even other non-native alternatives that aren't invasive, like lilac, for instance. You know, I mean, if you're really wedded to that particular look, um, you can find something that's not invasive. I just really think people need to eliminate invasives from their garden. Then um, here's a question which applies equally uh, to native plants, but this is a question about, will a returning sapsucker girdle my ornamental cherry tree? They don't really girdle it. They do put a lot of holes in it. <laughs> I have uh, rows and rows of holes in my apple trees. And I did put, um, I did put some arbor guards on it for the lower part but I, you will never completely stop it and they won't kill your tree. They may weaken it slightly, but it's very fun to watch what happens after the sap sucker leaves because other birds come in and drink the sap, hummingbirds, kinglets. So it's actually providing food to a variety of birds. So I suggest you put some protection on the lower part of the tree, but not worry too much about it further up. And I, I don't know, maybe in someone who's more familiar with orchards, there might be if you had a huge sap sucker population be a problem, but I've never seen it really hurt my trees. Okay, thank you. Um, here's a question. What are some plants off the top of your head that attract the kinds of insects that birds like in addition to oaks? Oh, well, there's, it, it, I really suggest cowscape because 
Um, I can't ever remember all the larval host plants um, that, you know, like you pick a plant like coffee berry and it will, it will attract 10 or 20 different moth species. So that's an example of a shrub that attracts a lot of birds for the caterpillars and insects. So that would be one example. Um, any, any of our native shrubs are going to have larval if you see a butterfly on it laying its eggs or a moth, it's going to have caterpillars. So I, I, I really suggest you go to Calscape. Uh, any member of the cherry family is extremely useful to birds. So you can plant native prunus species. They're second only to oaks in the number of caterpillars that, and insects that they harbor. Great. Um, I didn't see other questions at this point. There was one person, Judy, who said she wished she could post a photo because she, it has to be the world record of the largest butterfly bush. <laughs> um, I was going to comment on butterfly bush again, because of our native lilacs, the Ceanothus, those seem to have some of the better qualities of, uh, of butterfly bush, but they're strictly native and they have so many things to recommend them. Yeah, in fact, the deer brush, uh, in Cyanothus integerimus has a flower cluster that actually is kind of the same shape and everything. And they are both blue and white flowered varieties. And it also has the advantage, it's like, like butterfly bush, it's quite fast growing. So if you're trying to create a fast screen, the only downside is that deer will browse it. So when it's small, I would definitely put a cage around it. So, okay. Um, any other questions? Well, Nancy, you've covered the you've covered the topic. Um, and uh, Kate Brennan posted that uh, Doug Tallamy's Bring Nature Home has a list of the native trees that host the most caterpillars. So that's a good resource. It's a great book. He's written, um, what's the other one? Oh, Nature's Best Hope is his, his most, is one of his more recent books as well. But I recommend them highly, both of, but all of his books. Yeah, even um, though it's kind of East Coast oriented, he does have lists for our area. And mm -hmm. the principles are the same, regardless of where you live. So you can um, call it a 10 acre grassy suburban house into a bird mm -hmm. habitat garden. And he talks about that in his books of what happened, how it transformed. Okay, thank you. So I've gotten a couple of questions about whether the PowerPoint file will be available for download and people can see it on YouTube. Um, it's, it's just such a huge file. Our, we're not yeah. 200 <laughs> megabytes or something. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think, um, not, but we haven't done that before. Let's put it that way, because it is such a huge file and we have a limited space on our website. We, the, uh, that would take basically, um, it, would, it would, basically we'd have to take most of the rest of what's on our website off in order to host it there. So I'm sorry, but you can see it anytime you want on YouTube and you can watch it over and over. Yeah. And also I do have a resource list. Um, I, I, I will give it to um, Chrissy and we can, you can post that on the website, mm -hmm. all the different resources related to bird gardening and habitat gardening. Great, Shane just um, posted the, the, the link to the YouTube page. So that's available. And you're gonna post your resource list. Uh, maybe we could somehow link that to the YouTube page. And, and, yeah, and I'll, send it, I'll send it to you techie folks and you can uh, get it posted. Okay, great. All right. Well, thank you very much, Nancy. Great job. We appreciate you. And, uh, thank you all for attending. I hope it helps people get going for the birds. <laughs> Don't forget our plant sale. We are going to have some terrific bird plants. Most of the ones you mentioned are, will be there. So thanks. Oh, but just to make sure you know, there's there are articles on our website about it. It is an online sale, but 
um, you will be able to link from the, the various plant species that are on the list that is already posted on our website to see information about each specific plants, including, including photos of the plants that are available. So, all right, well. Happy gardening and bird watching, yes. everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Good night. Good night.